am really excited and delighted to um, introduce Dr. Larry Schooler to all of you. Um, the list of possible professions I could give is so long. Um, you can read them all in the event program uh, that's on the web page sponsored by Clearwater, but I'll just mention a few. He's a mediator, a facilitator, a public engagement consultant. I think he's soon going to be a podcast host. He's an author, um, has a book that um, for some of us nerds is perfect reading that deals with uh, public meetings. And um, he also, the way that I was first uh, truly introduced to Dr. Schooler was through a podcast that he was a guest on. Um, and it, the, the title of the, the podcast was The Water Nerd's Guide to Rocking Public Meetings. And like, to me, I just felt like this is a message that this audience would so appreciate and could learn from. So we reached out to Dr. Schooler and he graciously agreed to join us and share some of his thoughts he is a Texan. Uh, Austin, city of Austin, worked there for a number of years. Not currently here, but probably making his way back soon enough. So, with that, um, thank you so much for joining us, uh, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Leah. Hi, everybody. I know I can't hear you or see you, but hello. Great to be with you. I am so used to being able to sort of talk with you and interact and so a number of the the tricks that i would have up my sleeve for a presentation like this i had to keep in the bag and i'm not really a joke teller i felt like if i tried to tell a joke it probably wouldn't go well so i'm not gonna <laughs> <laughs> um, i uh but i am extremely excited to be here and flattered to have been invited and i do want to give a shout out to uh, stephanie and Ariane and the folks at road water who produced that podcast water in real life it's it's really a a great gift to sort of the the field that you all are in as well as sort of the fields that we're in in terms of communications and and community engagement and so forth and so i'm so glad that they have that podcast that they work so hard to make it a success and that folks like uh, leah and others uh, heard the episode that i happen to be featured on so uh, i'm going to get right into it and for those who listen to podcasts you know that you can sometimes uh, change a setting to where it can either be half speed or like one and a half or two speed so it may feel like this is 2x two two times as fast um, but I will be willing to, to share slides with folks who request them uh, after the fact. And so um, if you miss something or, or can't get a, a note taken quick enough, uh, fear not. Um, so just want to make sure that the slides are advancing and that you're seeing that. Yes, it is. We're seeing your screen perfectly. Okay, very good. So um, this uh, sort of mantra uh, up on the screen is kind of what I do my work by, uh, that those affected by a decision should be able to affect that decision. And quite honestly, um, I, I think that this could apply to, to a lot of our life in general. You know, certainly when we're making decisions as a family, I think all of us, uh, from my six-year-old Robbie to my nine-year-old Sammy to my wife Jolie to myself, want to feel like we have some sort of chance to affect the, the decision. Um, but I think it also applies to uh, the organizations that are a part of this uh, remarkable summit. And, you know, I, I think it's important, by the way, I have no idea who originally said this. It's something I say a lot, but I don't claim uh, pride of ownership. But I want to make a few additional um, caveats on this. This applies even during a pandemic. I think um, certainly if you've read the news or, or watched the news anytime in the last, you know, day or several months, you've noticed that a lot of people want their voices heard, whether it be on how we manage the pandemic, how we open or don't open schools and the rest of society. And that's putting aside the enormously large conversation about how we police America, how we protect Americans, how we enforce the law in America. Um, none of that is, is sort of taking a breather, despite the fact that a lot of our in-person gatherings have stopped. So this, this notion of those affected by a decision given the chance to affect it uh, is not um, it is not suspended based on the pandemic and it applies whether we are gathering people for a traditional public meeting or doing it remotely or virtually it also i think applies even when it feels like there quote unquote isn't time and what i mean by that is you know sometimes when we're embarking on some sort of public process or outreach we might have you know a lot of weeks or months to sort of take our time and do the process right 
And a lot of what's happening these days is happening very, very quickly. And again, I don't think that excuses us from the responsibility of needing to uh, involve those affected by our decisions. And it also, I think, is important to think about it in the context of decisions that you or your staff or your colleagues don't necessarily think is that big of a deal, because quite honestly, uh, that can be in the eyes of the beholder. And I think that sometimes we assume that folks won't care about a particular decision that a body like a groundwater conservation district is going to make until we uh, find out otherwise. I am an enormous fan of the radio, originally radio and television show Dragnet. I assume most folks are familiar with this remarkable uh, police procedural, um, but I did want to give this caveat that the stories you're about to hear and read about are true. The names have been omitted to protect, well, the folks who have the names in the, in the stories. So I uh, just wanted to be able to share some uh, stories without uh, embarrassing anybody. Um, but to start with, there was an article written uh, in the Austin American Statesman a little while back that talked about how a uh, Texas municipality had been vying for a permit from a, a groundwater conservation district uh, to pump water annually from a well on private property to supply the city's future needs, and some residents have mounted legal challenges uh, over that very thing. Then you look at the farm uh, agriculture industry. This one particular underground water conservation district has, quote, caught a lot of flack from farmers. These people have never had water production limits before, and so they are, um, you know, totally caught flat-footed by the prospect of having to, you know, get along with others, and they feel like they want to have a say. Wall Street Journal did a story about a private property owner who got a permit uh, that came about as a result of a settlement with the Groundwater Conservation District, and a nearby landowner sued, calling that settlement a sham and saying they should have been allowed to weigh in on the other family's plans. So that just goes to show you that uh, this notion of who's affected by a decision and, and who should be able to affect it is, is very much in the eyes of the beholders. Then you look at hydrology. A hydrologist said that a particular pumping permit request was not sustainable, and could eventually cause other wells to dry up, but the applicant in that case demanded a rehearing from the conservation district and said, if you don't give us that new hearing, this district has issued its last permit. They eventually protested another permit application, which can drown, pardon the expression, the conservation district in paperwork and legal fees, so there are real consequences to this. And of course, you know, sort of looking at a macro level, the Texas legislature has told these districts to um, come up with plans for the next 50 years, and that sort of has necessitated a certain level of collaboration and compromise. Um, and and in, in the eyes of one uh, person quoted in this article, uh, that's the only way to maintain irrigation agriculture. We're trying to put water conservation policies in the hands of the people. And then last but not least, there was an international study that looked at regional water master planning uh, across the world. And they noticed that the lack of local associations representing all the groundwater users at the aquifer level was a real problem as they tried to put the regional water master plan together. So, way to scare us, last keynote speaker of this summit. No problem. But what should we actually do about it? I'm so glad you asked. So, in my mind, as you can see, this is kind of a, a delicate balance. You need to think about a balanced and blended strategy for your public engagement. So partly that means when we reconvene folks in person that we redefine what a public meeting or a town hall is in terms of allowing for both maximum interactivity and to hear from a much broader cross section of the, the participating public, the affected public. It means leveraging even what we might consider now rudimentary forms of technology, and I'll talk about that in a minute, and that helps us to reach a large portion of our population that is often missing from the conversation. And then we need to think, I think, beyond just the, the more basic forms of technology to figure out how we can get even deeper into the areas that we serve and into the populations that we serve uh, to really understand what folks think. So I think in order to do this, you need to work from a foundation of some core values. And I'm part of an organization, just like you're part of this association, I'm part of one called the International Association for Public Participation. And they've developed this list of core values for this work. So, for example, it's based on the belief that those affected by a decision have a right to be involved in the decision making. The promise that their contribution will actually influence the decision. Uh, sustainable decisions that recognize and communicating needs of all, including the decision makers. F seeking out and facilitating the involvement of those potentially affected. There are a lot of times that we may post the required legal notice 
for some sort of hearing or decision making uh, that might look like it's in English, but is only um, likely to be understood by maybe some of the attorneys that are part of this uh, summit. And so it behooves us to think, how can I translate this in a way that either someone who has nothing to do with this topic can understand it, or someone who doesn't know all the jargon can understand it. It also sometimes involves seeking input from participants and designing how they participate. So your public may say, you know, we want you to come to our existing homeowners association meetings or to our Lions Club, or please uh, email us. We'll give you input over email, but that should be a conversation. We also need to explain exactly the data that we're using to develop a decision and give people the proper amount of context. And then we need to explain to people in the closure of that feedback loop how their input actually affected the decision. So you told us this and we did that. Now, lest you fear that you have to do everything that the public may suggest you do, understand that that's not what I'm suggesting. What I am suggesting is that you be in a position to say, well, here's why we're not able to implement that particular suggestion, or here's how we can modify that suggestion to fit our parameters or our budgets or our legal uh, responsibilities. There's also, I think, different levels of engagement that will vary depending on the, the type of decision. And so, you know, you could have folks on this left-hand side of the spectrum where you're just trying to provide information. So that might be in response to some major emergency or crisis, <clears throat> maybe a, a lack of water or some water quality issue that you just need to get addressed and you want to make sure people have robust information from you to manage that, all the way to the right-hand side of the spectrum where you may ultimately be putting something on a, on a ballot for the public to decide one way or the other. And obviously those kinds of decisions are very few and far between, but I think it's important to consider as you embark on some sort of engagement, you know, what is the public's role here? And then how should we communicate that to the public as we get it underway? I, I just want to underscore the point that uh, engagement has become even more important in some respects as we make our way through this pandemic than it might have been before. This study from Hill and Knowlton um, surveyed about a thousand people and as you can see many of them felt that it should get more important uh, rather than less important uh, to make sure that they are asked for their input and given the chance uh, to uh, to weigh in. So there's all different kinds of reasons that you might engage. So you may have a legal obligation to do so. You also may want to make sure that whatever decisions you're making are truly a representative of the public interest. You may want to get new solutions to a, a thorny issue that you're facing. You may want to share information. As I indicated in some of those anecdotes, it probably could be conflicts between different users that you need to manage or resolve. You also, as I indicated in some of those stories, may just want to limit delays, mistakes, and lawsuits. One of the, the most, I won't say effective, but certainly one of the most tried and true ways that people try to block uh, policy decisions these days is through the courts. And that doesn't mean they'll get the outcome they desire, but it could um, really tax the groundwater conservation district to the point that it becomes uh, highly problematic to, to follow through. You may also want to sort of generate greater support for it, whatever it is that you are trying to accomplish. So oftentimes a groundwater district may be asking for certain sacrifices on the part of their uh, residents or their users or just other, you know, regulations. And I think having folks involved in the conversation as to what that should look like and how it should be carried out has been shown to increase the likelihood that they will be ultimately supportive. And then I think it also helps to build relationships. And one of the things that I think is, is easy to forget is that you all are the kind of regulatory body that people um, don't necessarily have a close relationship with until a critical moment. And I think the more that you can invest in um, proactively communicating with the, the population you serve, explaining who you are, what you do, why you're there, what some of the issues are that you're trying to address, what you might be asking them about in the future, uh, the more trust you're gonna build and the more likely it is that they'll wanna participate in good faith uh, when you ask for their uh, involvement. So I just wanna go through a few of the ways that this uh, actually happens. And so traditionally, we've had some sort of either city council or legislature or board meeting, and we've given people three minutes at the microphone. Uh, that is pretty exclusionary because if you really think about it, uh, the number of people, the percentage of a population who's comfortable doing that, particularly if they know they're going to be on TV or the internet or sort of documented for all perpetuity uh, or walking into a hostile crowd at that meeting and who have the disposable time to research the topic, and write a speech and wait around for their turn, that's a really small percentage and, and we've relied too heavily on that form of participation up to now. I've also included canvassing because I think 
There are cases where we've seen folks actually go door to door or be set up, um, you know, in some place physically to sort of catch people as they're going by somewhere to get some input. We're starting to see, though, a, a big evolution in this. So rather than public hearings, we're having workshops where we might divide people into small groups and have them tackle a, a topic in a small group discussion. We're seeing agencies pop up in hot spots around the community where they expect foot traffic to catch people as they go by. We're also forming uh, stakeholder groups or task forces that are representative of all the different interests on a particular topic in order to get some consensus uh, that then uh, a board can implement. And then we've been working on something called Conversation Core, where we've actually trained community members to help facilitate some of this dialogue for us because we, we often don't have the staff, but if we can get community members to go out and collect some public input, uh, that can be really useful to us. And then, of course, we get into remote and virtual. And, and one thing you'll hear me talk about um, a lot is that virtual and online are not one and the same. Uh, we need to appreciate not only that there's still a healthy percentage of the population without internet access at all, but even those who do have internet access don't necessarily have the kind of access that would allow them to be on a call like this today. You know, it takes a certain amount of bandwidth, a certain amount of speed, costs money. Uh, you need to make sure that your kids aren't, you know, hogging the internet for, for school uh, at the same time as you're trying to engage. So um, you can hear me talk about a lot of different ways for uh, folks to engage that don't necessarily depend on uh, internet access. And here's just a little bit of an illustration of that. This is data, data from the uh, Pew Charitable Trust that shows you that, you know, even if you look at U.S. adults as a whole, uh, home broadband is still not present in more than one out of every four homes, and it starts to get um, uh, more absent, uh, less present as you go through certain demographic groups, especially lower educated and poorer folks, as well as rural uh, homes. I also want to just mention on this slide that you'll see a, a pretty high uh, penetration in terms of smartphone internet access. And I think that's significant because the way someone accesses the internet on a smartphone is going to be different than if they're on a desktop. And we need to, to recognize that as we as we use it to our advantage. Now, I, I mentioned that, that virtual doesn't mean online necessarily. And so I just want to highlight a couple of things. One is that Nearly every government agency in the United States and even some elsewhere have access to some sort of government access TV station that by law they have to have and or that they're entitled to, I should say, and that should only be used for sort of governmental public purposes. And most of the time, if you've ever tuned into these, they're just putting on that official city council meeting and then they either go dark or they just replay it or they have some canned programming from somewhere that, you know, is, is easily um, can easily be irrelevant to a lot of their audience. So there's an underutilized resource there. And then when it comes to text messaging, I think it's it's easy to forget that while you know young people may seem like the ones that, that are more likely to text, I mean, these, these stats are, are truly remarkable in terms of how often people use texting as their most significant way of communication. And in particular, how often they're likely to open a text as compared to an email, which I found truly astonishing. 98% open texts versus 20% of email. So one of the things that we've been doing for our clients in this pandemic is we've been standing up a toll-free number that we staff and screen and then bridge over into the meeting that the, the body is having to allow people to comment on the items that are before that body. Now, this is something that we were asked to do in the light of the pandemic, but I'm hearing from some of our clients that they actually would like this to continue even afterwards. And, and the reason for that is they're starting to hear from a lot of people that they had never heard from before. And in cities where this has become the norm, meaning pre-pandemic, uh, but even during pandemic, they notice that the audiences of folks who come and, and testify in person are very different demographically than the folks who are calling in. And so I think it's important to consider how to avail ourselves of input beyond our sort of super citizens or usual suspects and really get a broader cross-section of, of viewpoints uh, through just a, a fairly simple tool like uh, this one. Then um, we've been doing something called a view from you, which is a, a telecast that we do on our government access TV channel in a particular market where we have toll-free numbers in English and Spanish that people can either call into or would dial out to random uh, segments of the population. And then we allow people to uh, text in as well and post on social media. And so what we have found is that compared to what a typical meeting might be, we're getting thousands of people to join what might seem like esoteric 
uh, topical uh, conversations because it's super convenient and you know they're they're excited to be asked um, even if they just got the call that evening uh, and it's a recorded message from the mayor they're still interested in giving you their opinion it's carefully facilitated it's carefully moderated but the point is we're getting much beyond the self-selecting few that are inclined to sort of show up for your typical public meetings there's other ways to um, affect real-time feedback through text messaging and this screenshot is one of a, a software called poll everywhere i have no you know relationship with them other than just um you know kind of the uh the my fondness of the tool um, but this really helps because the answers pop up in real time and it doesn't depend on internet and you don't have to be sitting physically close to where the polling is, is emerging from. It's just uh, based in the, in the cloud. So you don't need internet access, even though it relies on internet to display uh, the answers in real time, but it really can help both with multiple choice and with open-ended uh, questions. And then there's a way to have it be what we call asynchronous, meaning let people respond anytime uh, so there's a platform called Text Talk Act or Text Talk Engage, where you have people opt into a particular conversation uh, and they can join, uh, they get sort of a question, they respond to it, then they respond to a new question. And it's a way for people to give input. Uh, they don't have a lot of time um, and don't maybe have a ton to say, but are willing to, to share it anonymously via uh, text message. So then I think we have to think about uh, other tools that we can uh, use to make interactive workshops happen. And as you can tell, um, there is an astonishing number of different platforms out there that are doing this kind of thing. Now, first, I want to direct you to the picture because what you'll see there are um, small groups as opposed to one big audience with one microphone. We, we gave people name tags with a numeral on them, like they were coming to a wedding reception. And so they got randomly assigned to a table of folks that they may not know, but, but get to know in the course of the conversation. Each of them had a facilitator and they had kind of an interactive exercise. Uh, to do. There were also displays around the room that allowed them to get more detailed information on a, a specific part of the topic. So sort of a hybrid of an open house and a, a conversation. But a lot of these platforms that you're seeing on screen allow people to uh, make comments directly onto a map or comment during a discussion board that's like a threaded moderated discussion forum. So you're sort of mimicking what a public meeting might be, but for a broader audience that can participate anytime uh, it's convenient. Uh, you also have tools that um, really do make a, an open house virtual. So you can sort of click through different stations, so to speak, and, and give comments on a board the way you would have if you'd been at the, at the meeting. MetroQuest is particularly an interesting platform. Again, I have no relationship with them, but they have taken surveys to a whole new level. We're used to SurveyMonkey and just picking from text-based multiple choice questions. MetroQuest has all different kinds of, of visualizations and ways to, to drag and drop priorities and slide different things in terms of how important they are, see how your priorities stack up with different potential scenarios. So all of those applications, I think, could be very relevant for uh, a groundwater conservation district. Again, I'll be able to, to furnish this uh, slide deck to you on, on request, and so I can share with you more information about all of these platforms with, uh, with more time. I did want to also mention a particular tool where the, the whole notion of trade-offs takes center stage. So Balancing Act is one where it's, it's often focused on a budgetary question, but quite honestly, given uh, some of the necessary trade-offs that you all have to consider in terms of who gets what amount of water, it could certainly be very uh, reasonably applied to a public conversation about about water usage and about permitting. And so I would encourage you to check out this particular platform uh, for an application like that. So I know that I'm uh, getting close to the amount of time that I have with you. So I wanna leave you with some uh, food for thought and some questions that I think you should be asking in your districts or in your uh, organizations. What does public engagement mean? Why does it matter? Um, what should we expect of the public? And perhaps what should we expect uh, in terms of our own outreach and engagement? What are we committing to, whether it be amount of notice or different ways for people to participate uh, and so on? When it comes to policy, uh, should we have some sort of a uh, consistent policy around our engagement, standard operating procedures? Where should we leave room for there to be some creativity as opposed to sort of a, a mandate? By the way, these transitions are courtesy of my nine-year-old son. I had no idea that these transitions, uh, I only knew about animations before today. Uh, when it comes to process, we have to remember that it's not just about a single 
standalone meeting. It's also about kind of walking the public through a decision-making process. So thinking from the, you know, keeping beginning with the end in mind, what are we trying to achieve? Who is our intended audience or who needs to be part of this conversation? What are we trying to glean in the way of specific forms of input? What kinds of questions should we ask in light of that? And what are we actually going to do with that information? All of that needs to be conveyed up front and repeatedly to the public as you uh, step through it. And then I think in terms of, of sort of the toolkit, um, who are we specifically trying to reach will help dictate the tool. So uh, a younger audience, for example, might respond better to social media, where an older audience might respond better to just a regular old telephone call or a face-to-face -face visit or uh, outreach through an organization that they're a part of. Uh, so the tools are vast, but the particular application of the tool is based on what you're trying to get as well as whom you're trying to uh, reach and, and what specifically do you want to know. The last thing I just want to mention is that I think that doing this well does require uh, training for your team, sometimes for your leadership. And these are some of the topics that I have historically found are, are really important. And I, I lead with listening because I know we all may have the the physical capacity to to hear sound, um, but listening, I think, is is something a little bit different. Um, listening is really, in this context anyway, it's about um, showing empathy, um, demonstrating that you're really hearing what the person is saying uh, and, and digesting it and, and uh, incorporating it into your thinking. So I think it goes beyond just the physical act of, of hearing sounds. Public speaking comes into it because I think a lot of times we drown our publics in um, hard to understand PowerPoints, maybe like this one. Um, and, and we also just don't realize what what we're saying is going to sound like to someone who's coming into this topic uh, totally cold. And so some training in that space, I think, is, is useful. And a lot of times I think folks uh, in government are called upon to do this without that, that kind of background. They're just they're trained in a particular subject matter rather than in how to present. Uh, in terms of facilitation and mediation, I mean, this is part of what I do for a living. It's helpful to have someone separate from the staff, separate from the decision makers who can focus just on having a productive meeting, keeping the space safe for comfortable dialogue, uh, balancing between different uh, opposing viewpoints, managing any kind of conflict. So some of the training in that space is useful uh, for sure. And then design work. So designing a meeting, designing an overall process, uh, leveraging technology in the ways that I was talking about earlier. All of those forms of training, I think, are. Uh, very uh, worthwhile. A last few a set of questions that I would say, um, I think we've sort of hit all of these. What values should underpin our engagement? What kinds of changes or improvements should we make to any kind of existing procedures we have? How should we collaborate as an organization? I know some of you are very small organizations, but how should we collaborate maybe with outside organizations like a local uh, college or university or just with other community organizations? What tools should we acquire or hone that we don't really have and what training should we get? So those in my mind are some of the key questions for, uh, for you to answer. And I'm certainly happy to answer any questions that you have uh, today. But again, wanna extend my deepest thanks to Leah and the whole team and, and to Rogue Water and to Stephanie and Ariane for introducing me to this group. And um, I also wanna thank you all because I think if it weren't for you, um, I don't know that I would and my family and I would have you know, safe water for all the different things we needed for, for the farmers to grow the foods that we eat, for us to recreate and relax, uh, in some cases for us to drink. Uh, so for that, I thank you all very much. So turn it back over to thank Leah. You. That was fantastic. And we do have a lot of questions that came in. I don't think we're gonna be able to get to all of them, but I'd like to touch on a few. Um, before I do though, I also wanna share a message that came in for you. And it was just a thank you from somebody who actually had to drive 65 miles to a local library to access the internet so that they could participate in this virtual conference. Wow. And that and that attendee just so appreciated your recognition that not everybody has the internet. So um, wanted to pass that along well, that, to you. Yeah, that's really nice. And I just, I, I inadvertently, when they mentioned the library are also bringing up an important partnership opportunity because I think we've too, for too long thought of libraries as just places to go get a book. And obviously, um, we're still doing that. I know I'm doing it every day, but I think we really can call upon libraries to host events because uh, a lot of them have those spaces, but also to provide the resources that some folks will need either to get up to speed on a topic or, as, as this person said, to actually connect to the discussion. So 
Yeah, absolutely. So, so we did have somebody ask, you know, a lot of GCDs have small budgets. And so where would you, when you talk about a lot of these things that, you know, GCDs could do, where should a district with a, a very small budget prioritize? I mean, to me, it comes to training and, and volunteer recruitment. Um, I would, you know, sort of develop a kind of a, a buffet or a, a menu of things you feel like would be helpful for your staff to get trained on. Um, and not necessarily, um, you don't necessarily have to get those courses a la carte. I mean, there's there's certain trainers, frankly, I consider myself one of them who custom build, you know, a class or a, a couple of classes based on the particular needs of a client. And so um, I would I would focus on staff training and then I would also um, work to establish some way for volunteers to assist you with this effort. And, and it, it takes some training of them. So either that training can be done by you all or it can be done by someone from the outside with some experience. But either way, if, if you're in a position to then disseminate a message and a set of questions for those folks to go out and, and collect info for you on, obviously that is pretty much as cost effective as you, as you may get, I think, even including staff time. So we did that in, at the city of Austin out of sheer necessity, meaning if we didn't do it, we'd never get to a meaningful cross-section of the population, I don't think. And so, um, it was it was mission critical to us, and we're a fairly large organization with you know a million people uh, who live in the in the city limits. So for for smaller communities, I also think it's it's really worthwhile. Yeah. So you just actually kind of created a nice transition into another question that came in, and how um, you know what would your advice be in terms of engaging underrepresented communities in groundwater? Um, groundwater is controlled by landowners. A lot mm -hmm. of communities, however that depend on groundwater aren't necessarily landowners. And those are some of the underrepresented communities like Hispanic communities. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think a lot of it depends on relationships that you build with organizations and entities who have contact with those populations. And so it ties back into the relationship build significance. You know, I, in fact, I'm on a project now where I know that if my team of consultants we're the ones doing the asking, we won't get much response. But if we tap, say, the Urban League or the YMCA or the Boys and Girls Club, or in particular, the Latinx population, I think is, is very tied into um, to their faith communities, as well as to some social service organizations and some business organizations. Forgive me for stereotyping, I don't mean to overgeneralize there, but I, I think that what matters is who's doing the asking. And so, there's going to be a, a better response, I think, if you're able to hit some grass tops who can then help you both with conveying the message, but frankly, also deciding what that message should be. Because again, we're often sort of uh, immersed in the, the jargon and the minutia and the kind of the, the, the stuff we deal with every day. And, and we're not necessarily putting ourselves in the minds of someone who's never thought about this before, who doesn't know that there's a GCD, who doesn't know the difference between groundwater and other kinds of water. Um, and so having someone to both be a gatekeeper to help us reach the population and sort of a, an interpreter, not necessarily a language interpreter, although that matters, but also an interpreter of what we're trying to say and what makes it relevant to whatever that population uh, might be. But just to be clear, I mean, I'm not above, you know, asking a pastor to announce something from the pulpit, you know, or put it in a church bulletin or um, you know, any, any number of other associations to, to pass messages along because again, you know, even myself, you know, I know what I'm more likely to open uh, in the way of email and texts given how busy I am and, and there's certain organizations that I'm, I'm immediately gonna open it. So that, that matters. But thank you for that. And then another question, this may be the last one we have time for, are there pitfalls to engaging with the public too early, particularly on hot button issues? Hmm. Well, I mean, I think there are pitfalls across public engagement obviously and i mean i think if i had um had more time with you all I, I would certainly have have stepped through even more of them than i did at the front end but what i think sometimes happens is you you want to be able to sort of manage expectations of the public in terms of what they can actually influence and what is already sort of decided in one form or another and that may be decided by the district it may have been dictated by state law or federal law or some other, you know, law, or there could be budgetary, you know, uh, considerations there. But a lot of times, I mean, I've even been in situations where a client has said to me, please go facilitate this public meeting. And what I discover 
is that they've sort of made up their minds. And so they're feeling like they should just do the meeting because it's a good idea and it'll make them, you know, look good. But in reality, um, they're setting the public up for disappointment and obviously a potential major threat to the trust that the, the public has in that institution. So to an extent, I guess if you start early, you may give um, a little bit of, of um, I'll say, false hope to, uh, to certain members of the public to think that they can sort of call all the shots. And so that's, I think, addressed best by just saying, look, here's, here's what's already been decided. Here's what's still up for discussion. Here's what we want to know from you all. And here's what we're going to do with that information. Most importantly, here's, here's how we're going to use what it is that you tell us. Because I think some people think that you're just going to go with sort of a majority vote on whatever it is that's up for consideration. And so if they rally enough folks and get enough T-shirts and buttons and whatever, that they'll sort of carry the day. Um, and, and I think it's just critical to make plain that, you know, that's that's not the way we're going to do this. And, and here is what's going to happen and what you can expect. Thank you so much. So we are out of time, but there were two things I just want to reiterate that you said that I thought were fantastic points for this audience. And one is about the legal notices. And OK, yeah, you can post that legal notice, but having that translation into what your public can understand is a, is a valuable thing to do. There's a, uh, there's a great TED talk where the guy takes a Nike ad and then puts it in a sort of legal notice form. Yeah. So it's like, you know, a dietric oh, uh, manufacturer of can be on camera. I don't know what I'm oh. hearing there. Um, I, you know, he, he sort of buries this Nike ad that's usually, you know, just do it with the swoosh. Uh, and it says, you know, supplier of, of apparel intended for the human foot uh, advertises, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, available, yeah. you know, foot coverings and so on. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. No. And the other point you made, too, is about, you know, like not just holding those official public meetings where you give everybody their two or their three minutes. You know, I think it's sometimes we forget that people are intimidated um stand you know i mean not only are there barriers to just physically getting there but the the emotional barrier of standing up in public and making those comments uh probably keeps a lot of people away um and i, I think I that's would, a good thing to remember yeah and i always tell people that i mean obviously i'm comfortable with public speaking and i'm i'm an extrovert i've never done that I've never spoken at a public meeting and it's not necessarily out of pure fear but it's like well what if my opinion isn't the the consensus in the room, the majority view in the room, am I going to get booed? Um, am I going to remember everything I want to say in three minutes? Am I going to, not to mention, have the time to sit around and wait and arrange childcare and, you know, all that other stuff. So, yep. yeah, I, I think we take that for granted and, uh, and we've got to keep it in mind. Thank you so much for joining us. It was I'm really sure. an honor. So interesting to hear from you. Uh, Dr. Larry Schooler, uh, wish we could have hosted you in person, but I'm glad that we were able to to accommodate your participation virtually all the way from Florida. So thank you. Yeah, so me too. Best to you. Thank you.